massive pause at the start. It's often the little pitfalls of trying to do live streams on your own without production, if you like. Um, right, we're going to answer some of your questions today. I was meant to be doing this live outside, but the trouble is um, it's the showers are coming over so quick and they're so heavy, I can't get the hardware outside. Um, otherwise, we just get soaked and I don't want to wreck my hardware. So welcome everyone. A little lunchtime live as my lunch is cooking. If you're just joining me, um, I'm answering some of your questions I put out on social this morning for you to ask some questions. I'm answering more questions with golfonline.co.uk in their videos as well, which I pull from those tweets and Facebook posts I put out. So keep your eye on their channels for your answer. And I'm going to answer a few today. And if you've got any more that you want to answer or ask as we go, I'll try and catch them as we do the live feed. Joe says, hello, hello, Joe. How are you doing, Joe? You having a good one? It's a little lunchtime live. Hello from Michigan. Mr. Q, hello from Michigan. How is it in Michigan? Never been to Michigan, actually. I don't even quite know um, where Michigan is. Uh, yo, Marky, hello from Baltimore, Maryland. Hello, N3QDZ. How are you doing in Baltimore? Right, first question came from Twitter. Dave Mason asks, hi, Mark. Have I have a bit of a trouble in taking my good swing from the range to the first tee. Any help? Hashtag ask AGG. Hey, Mark. Hey, Ian Evans. Hello. Um, Dave, this is probably the most reoccurring question I get asked, um, and I'm sure other pros do as well. Basically, the challenges and questions asked of you on the golf course. If you just watch some of our course vlogs, you'll see the, the, the questions that we're constantly getting asked are so different to the questions that you get asked on the golf course. So what happens is that if those questions are different, sloping lies, wind and rain, how your opponent is playing, for instance, will affect um, your take on a shot. So if you think about our very recent course vlogs in Iceland, Matt's um, kind of holding out of bunkers when I'm making a charge completely spins the game. It completely spins the game into a whole new um, kind of pressure on me now as I was actually starting to apply pressure on him. Those kind of things are really hard to recreate on the range. So what you actually get on the range is this kind of false golf situation, flat lies, dry, perfect, nothing getting trapped between the ball and the club or not as much as out on the grass. You don't get the competition. Um, you're not affected by the wind as much because you've got another ball. So you hit one, wind takes it, and then you just kind of adjust on the next one where on the course you get one go at it. So that's the most common question I get asked, and it's often because the challenges are not the same, and it's that people are not understanding that those challenges are so different. So advice really would be to try and do as much practice on the range if it's the only place you can practice, really trying to string shots together, hit a drive, hit an iron, hit a wedge, hit a drive with trouble on the right, hit a drive with trouble on the left in your mind, set the targets out, um, and then hit iron shots into certain issues, you know, kind of trouble left, trouble right, those kind of things. And then take your practice to the course trying to mimic what you've done on the range. You know, it's that kind of real time practice. Hi from Germany, Fabian, hey. Um, yeah, so it's that kind of not understanding, I always think, the real challenges that you'll get on the course and see on the course to those not so real court challenges and not the realistic questions you're getting asked on the range all the time. How do you practice keeping the same tempo? Is a question just come from the live chat there. Um, I don't know. It's something I've never really worked with. It's something I wouldn't really advise you to think too much about. Tempo is such an undefined term. And often when it is, when it tries to have some definition, the definition is often very wrong. Um, I would look for answers in your bad shots in other ways. Loving the Under Armour gear, thank you. Adelaide, South Australia, here live. Hello, Ian, from live from South Australia. I guess you're coming into your summer. We're getting rubbish wintry weather, and I bet you're getting really nice warm weather. Morning, Mark the Spee from Atlanta, Georgia. East Lake survived the storm. Good to have you, Kevin. Glad, glad you survived the storm. It was pretty crazy. We were following the reports. Um, it looked pretty heavy, so good to have you here. 
Silly question. Oh, I missed that one. I'll that one again. Hi, Mark. What's the best three iron sets around at the moment to go and test as a 14 handicapper? Oh, that is a great question. What a great question. Split cavity MC. Um, sorry, MP18 split cavity SC. Split cavity. Got to be worth a go. Surely. Um, 14 handicapper. Throw a curveball in there, very different subject to your launches, those kind of things. Ping G400, that's got to be worth a go, isn't it? That is a good, for, for a game improvement club, it's chunky, but it's still trying to present some looks. So very different to, obviously, Split Cavity, just trying to keep it mixed there. Hello from Scotland. One more. Oh, I don't know if I can find, I'm going to give you two more, actually. Oh, I'm going to give you two more. And to be honest with you, I'm missing out. AP2 would be worth a go. These two are definitely worth a go. I'm not sure how long M1 stays in the range with Taylor made because I'm not that up to date with them and they're not that... Anyway, CBX, um, Cleveland, definitely worth a go. Impressed with the looks of that considering its game improvement was strong lofts. Spins were surprisingly decent considering the lofts, um, and then the M1. M1's always been one of my favourite kind of mid-range player irons. I've said that in videos, even though people seem to think I hate them tailor-made, even though I've said that's one of the best in its category. Mm. Some people just maybe don't listen. Is it worth changing from 714 AP2 to Mizuno MP18 split cavity? Go and test, see if it is. It's, um, it'd be a close call. AP2 714 is great club uh next question i got this one from facebook earlier from tony do you think non-members of golf clubs should be able to get official handicap cards in order to compete fairly in different club opens now that is a really good question and my understanding of the handicap system because i don't work in kind of golf club environments anymore and haven't done for years um, I was happy to get out of them because I do struggle with all the committee kind of stuff at golf clubs. I've worked in businesses most of my life. I've kind of got, become a bit kind of disconnected from the handicap rules and seats. My understanding was that you could. There were systems out there that the maybe the English Golf Union put in place that helped you get a handicap, which would then be recognised to go and play. But I absolutely think it should. Handicaps being controlled solely by clubs in such a stiff way does, for me, really, um, it's limiting, it, it, it's not encouraging, and one of the biggest problems golf has is often trying to be far too limiting and not encouraging. Um, getting people to have handicaps that are more broadly accepted definitely would be a good thing. Good question, that one. Um, what was your name? Tony, was it? Tony, on Facebook. Can't they pay for associate memberships around £50 to get an official handicap from Peter? Yeah, we'll post, post comments. Let us know down in the comment section down below. While you're down there, hitting the thumbs up button if you're liking the lunchtime lives. I'm going to try and do more of them. Um, I wanted to do this one outside if you missed the start of the broadcast, but the showers are coming over so quick and heavy at the moment in the UK, down in the southwest, that I couldn't get the harbour out there without the fear of getting it absolutely drenched. Uh, was coaching something, oh I missed that one, come down from 28 to 21, beginner for the season, how, now hit a brick wall, seem to be going backwards, any tips, brah, from Sam Aiken, yeah, go and get a lesson Sam, find out what you're doing wrong, what's holding you back, um, and also self-analyse a bit, maybe it's things like game golf, across, you know, those kind of stat packages that will help you really pinpoint maybe a bit more unemotionally, because that's what happens when people are on a golf course. They use their emotions to analyse rather than if you have a stat system. They're literally just going to count shots from different yardages and different locations and present data. Um, you'll be amazed with lessons and people I've played with who, like their interpretation of how they're playing. Uh, a classic example is Rory, your golf channel Rory, when he talks about how he's played sometimes after we filmed. Me and Matt literally look at each other and think... Okay, that's not quite how we saw it. And Rory's a clever guy and a pretty knowledgeable golfer, but still has that kind of amateur outlook on um, his game because he looks at it, I think, through emotions um, rather than physical numbers sometimes, which I think is interesting. I see that a lot from students. 
Are you jealous of Lockie's pin mate, Alex Cooper? Who wouldn't be jealous of Lockie's pins, you know? The thinnest pins in town. They are quite brown. He went on holiday and browned them up lovely. Uh, are those white boxes full of balls with your face on? Yeah, there's a lot of balls down there with my face on. And on that note, we had today back from Iceland... So he's claimed his prize. We had the Truvies uh, came back with my face on from Iceland. Excellent. So that's the third one found this year from Find My Truvies. Thanks to Callaway Golf. Um, this year, more out there and more still to be hit into trouble. Uh, so many gap wedges. 130. My sound wedges go 75. What do I do? Oh, I missed it. Good lad, Alex Cooper. Wink, wink. Right, let's do a question that I can read and won't go away here. Um, how many times have people approached you this week asking, Jordan, can I have your autograph from James on Facebook? <laughs> Actually, most people come uh, approach me saying, oh, it's Mark Crossfield, that geezer from the internet with the annoying voice. Um, can I have a picture with Lockie? That's what they normally come and do. Um, Harry says, how do I stop sending my driver to the right? Now, that is as broad as a question goes. All right, Ewan, Lockie Pins. David, Iceland was a great series of matches. Absolutely was, David. And Iceland was one of the most surprisingly fantastic countries I've ever been to for golf. It was so inspiring and fun. And the courses were just... Like, if you could play one course in your life, Brelta Holt. I mean, they're all good, but Brelta Holt, the second one. <laughs> it'll just blow your blooming socks off. If you haven't watched it already, go and watch it. It's a fantastic... Um, course with amazing views so how do i stop hitting my driver to the right see i always think these questions are interesting what do, do for a huge gap okay mike your huge gap in gap wedges i'll try and answer that one in a second thanks for posting the gap um oh i'm getting thrown by all the questions what was it yeah how do i stop the question how do i stop hitting my driver to the right is too broad it, it it shows me that people's understandings of what a golf coach can do are misguided a little bit i mean what you can do to stop sending your driver to the right is you can hit it further left but that is going to help you do it you need to go and have a lesson because there could be so many reasons why you're sending that driver to the right and your first place of call, I would say, for you to start is looking at your strike. If you are striking it out the middle of the bat, you know, so you're hitting it really well, middle of the club stuff, bang, lovely strikes, and they're shooting right, there lies a problem. If you're misstriking them and they go off to the right, that's a very different problem to the first one. Do you see what I mean? There's so That question, I get those kind of broad questions a lot, and... They show me how me as a coach and other coaches, we're failing with kind of, I think, the message of what we actually can do with a student, things we can and can't answer, um, which is why I continue to make uh, as many videos as I can to try and help people understand what we can and can't do. So gap question back there from the sand wedges. So hits his sand wedge too far. Uh, and then, no, sorry, hits his sand wedge, say, 175 yards, I think, and then gap wedge 130. So gap wedges, obviously, there's different lofts, 52, 50, 49, 48. You know, you need to make sure a gap wedge isn't just one loft. You've got to understand that you might need to sink that loft with whatever your sand wedge loft is. And then another big thing I see with students is that when it comes to a sand wedge, and I saw Matt did a lesson on this, I think, the other day, and he posted on Instagram his results. Is the golfers aren't skilled enough at delivering different lofts with their sand wedge. They tend to deliver one loft, and often it's a very lofted version. They can't knock the loft down to get the different distances. So you're probably finding your sand wedge is... You're not skilled at delivering the different lofts to keep it in line with the other clubs. So if I'm going to hit a sand wedge full out, I will have to put it at the back of my stance and feel like I'm taking loft off to get it going out there. Otherwise, there's so much energy just sending the ball up in the air that it makes no distance, it pops up and kind of goes nowhere and then doesn't sync up with the clubs because as you take loft off your club, um, you start losing friction in theory. So the more loft you have, you're going to get more friction, you're going to get more slip, so you might get more spins and things like that, but you could get some non-spinny ones where it hits higher on the face and pops up in the air. So as you start taking loft down, nine irons compared to your sand wedges, the friction on the face is going to be different, which then in turn means launches and those things are going to be different. So you need to be controlling your launch, your spin, with those high lofted clubs um, and maybe learning how to maybe knock them down and get more out of them. Because it's one of the most common questions I see, uh, one of the most common issues, I should say, watching a student hit a sand wedge and they've got one shot with it. 
which is just to hit it. They just hit it. I'm just hitting myself, and it pops up in the air. And then when you measure, you know, they're getting 20 yards deviation short to long in distance with them. Um, good morning, Mark from the States. Play my blades. Hello, Nick Ramy. Thanks for watching. Hello. Remember, if you're liking the lunchtime lives or any of the live videos, hit that thumbs up button down there. It shows me that you like them and that you want more. Um, so, um, and I, I'm enjoying doing them. It's nice. To, the interaction is fun. And my lunch will be ready in a minute. So we're going to do one more question before we go. Um, if I've got one. Do we do this? In the right there. Okay. James Cook on Facebook said, um, or asked, does it hinder a golf swing to have your legs a lot wider than your shoulders width apart? Yes and no, it's player specific, but generally, as a generalised rule, I see over wide stance definitely affecting weight transfers, then in turn, a little bit of strikes, or where they're pushing their pressure on the ground is more challenging if you're very wide. So if you're very wide, you have to be very dynamic with shifting to the left. Obviously, as well, the more you change your width of stance, it changes, in effect, your ball position. So it changes it in relationship to your body. Because as you get wider, your bodies tend to tilt more or less, the narrower and wider. Um, hello from Australia. Hello. So, yes, being over wide, I think, can hurt people. But I've seen golfers standing at very different widths and hitting good and bad shots. Again, very player specific. So you would really want to test it for yourself personally than just going with a generalised rule. But the generalised rule that I see is that over wide stances, yes, can affect shots. Certainly, I see it a lot with drivers. Really wide and reaching along kind of goes together. Um, toe shots and heel shots as they try and find the middle from such a stretched position. You change their setup. Often you have to change face to path relationship as well, but the setup then kind of change as well helps them find the middle a bit more and really control strike a lot more. Um, fitting before lessons or lessons before fitting. Go on and Andrew, shall we finish on that one? I've said this in lots of um, videos, so hopefully the message starts to get through a little bit more. A fitting is a lesson, and a lesson is a fitting. They should be the same thing. So you should only be going for lessons. So if a student comes to me using a club, hi from Sweden, ding dong, hello. Uh, if a student comes to me using a club that doesn't suit their game, lofts, head, shaft weights, shaft feels, grips, lies, whatever it may be from all the many aspects that you would fit a club for, and I can change the club and quantify that they are better, I'm doing that before anything else uh, in a lesson. And any good coach would be doing the same because our job is to try and make you better. That's it. You need to be better. Um, if you're using clubs that make it hard for me to make you better, then I'm failing as a coach if I don't switch. Those. So this is where I struggle with custom fit at the moment. I think custom fits in a funny place in our industry. Um, maybe I could do some more videos on it as we go, but I know it will upset a lot of people. But I do think custom fitting is in a very sell, sell, sell place where I see custom fitting in a lesson as not different things. I never have done really. They're the same thing. Um, so one before the other, just go and have a lesson. And it should be a fitting as well. And if it's not, Oh, you don't phone up and ask your coach, look, I'm going to have a lesson. Will you be testing my equipment? Have you got the means to test my equipment, like decent balls, hitting areas, launch monitors, to check it's right around my delivery? Should I change my delivery or should I change my equipment or both? Those are the questions you want to be asking next week. Um, hi, Mark. Hit the ball very high. Strike is good, but I can't keep ball flight lower. Right, Matthew, try and answer, ask that one next time. I've run out of time because my lunch will be ready. Thank you all for watching. Hit that thumbs up button down there. Um, and don't be afraid to subscribe to the channel if you don't already. I'm going to be doing loads more lies. I did try to do this one outdoors if you missed the start of the feed today. But the showers and the rain's coming through, so they won't always just be answering questions in my office. I will be doing them on subjects um, as well. Thank you all for watching. Have a good lunch. Post those comments down below. Let me know. Any plans coming to Australia? Possibly very soon, Michael. It's all in the kind of mix at the moment. Speak to you soon. Enjoy your lunch. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, don't forget tonight, daily vlog tonight is an interesting one. It's about pull shots. So if you struggle with your pull shots, uh, watch tonight. See you all soon. Thanks for watching.